The cerebral cortex covers the entire surface of the brain and contains many functional areas that allow us to interact and engage with our environment. These functional areas do not operate in isolation. They are part of networks that are interconnected through highways of white matter lying deep in the forebrain. These fiber tracts consist of neuronal axons traveling from one brain region to the next. The total activity in the brain has been estimated to be up to thousands of terabytes per second all along those deep fiber tracts. But they are vulnerable to injury and following concussions can lead to diffuse symptoms such as dizziness and difficulty concentrating with long recovery times. Let's take a closer look at these subcortical fiber tracts. These fibers can be classified based on where they are going. Association fibers interconnect areas on the same side of the brain, providing important integration between all lobes on the one side of the brain. Commissural fibers cross the midline, connecting the two hemispheres. This allows for the integration of hemispheric networks into one functional unit. Projection fibers travel between the cortex and the brainstem. This allows for the connection of the forebrain with the brainstem and the spinal cord. The association fiber tract seen here is called the superior longitudinal fasciculus. As you can see, this tract is more compact in the middle region, with fibers fanning out into the frontal lobe anteriorly and into the occipital lobe posteriorly. In fact, the superior longitudinal fasciculus connects the frontal, parietal, occipital and temporal cortices for the integration of sensory information. A subset of fibers in the superior longitudinal fasciculus forms the arcuate fasciculus. It is just inferior to the main longitudinal bundle and the fibers arc to enter the temporal lobe. The arcuate fasciculus connects language areas. Broca's area here in the motor association area in the angular gyrus and Wernicke's area here, spanning the temporal lobes and going into the parietal lobe, close to the primary auditory areas. Wernicke's area is concerned with the comprehension of language, whereas Broca's area is concerned with the production of language. This connection is important so that we can understand what we say and say what we understand. We're both using this connection right now. These arcuate fibers form a connecting network between Broca's and Wernicke's areas. I've shown these two areas on the left hemisphere. This is because in most people, these language areas lateralize to the left hemisphere, regardless of handedness. While the dominant hemisphere deals with these important language functions, the non-dominant hemisphere also has language areas that are concerned with the melody of language, our accents and tone of voice. Würde eine Rose nicht genauso lieblich duften, wenn wir sie nicht mehr Rose nennen? Ce que nous appelons rose, par n'importe quel autre nom, sentirait aussi bon. Quella che chiamiamo rosa, anche con un altro nome, avrebbe il suo profumo. For that which we call a rose, by any other name, would smell as sweet. These language areas in the two hemispheres need to be connected so that we can produce language that not only conveys the content that we want to communicate, but also our personal speaking style. This network of crossing fibers contributes to corpus callosum, the largest bundle of commissural fibers. Corpus callosum is the most important bundle of commissural fibers in the CNS. It is easily identifiable and serves as a landmark throughout the brain. 
In this dissection, you can clearly see how the two hemispheres are connected through the commissural fibers passing through corpus callosum. A lot of functions in the CNS are lateralized to hubs located in a particular hemisphere. These hubs need to interact with each other, and in many cases, the activity in one hub results in the inhibition of another hub. In fact, most, if not all, commissural connections that pass through corpus callosum are inhibitory. So far, we have examined networks of fibers within the forebrain. However, this type of connectivity extends to all areas of the CNS. Ascending and descending tracts connect the forebrain with the brainstem and spinal cord. They are called projection fibers. On their way from the cortex to the brainstem, fibers form corona radiata and converge into a compact bundle called the internal capsule. Here, we have removed the lateral portions of the frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal lobes. This is the insula cortex, and you can see the fibers of corona radiata traveling to and from the cortex. On this specimen, we have removed the insula and underlying deep nuclei. You can see the corona radiata fibers converging to form the internal capsule. Additionally, this specimen shows an important bundle of association fibers, the inferior occipitofrontal fasciculus, and this hook-like uncinate fasciculus, which connects the temporal and frontal lobes. Let's take a closer look at the internal capsule in a horizontal section. The internal capsule is divided into two regions, or limbs. The anterior limb, which separates the head of the caudate from the putamen and globus pallidus. And the posterior limb, which separates the thalamus from the putamen and globus pallidus. A large amount of real estate in the brain has been allocated to deep fiber tracts, which interconnect all areas of cortex and deep nuclei, allowing information to be highly integrated. While this may seem obvious today, up until the early 1900s, there existed great controversy as to whether the brain consisted of a large number of highly specialized areas or of networks of interconnected brain regions. As modern neuroscience is increasingly moving towards a network understanding of brain function, the importance of these interconnecting fiber bundles is recognized more and more in the clinical world as well. In fact, a lot of research is currently being done on the integrity of these connections following traumatic brain injury.